welcome to everyone who has joined us on the call today. Um, we have a, a great webinar planned for you focusing on leveraging a youth adult allyship model to meaningfully engage youth in APP programming. And this has been a popular topic of interest among grantees because not only is it a strategy for boosting overall engagement, uh, recruitment and retention, but the use of a youth adult allyship model can also address the adulthood preparation subjects that make up part of uh, prep requirements. So um, the youth adult allyship model supports healthy life skills and even adolescent development and youth, uh, for example. And as our presenter today will describe in more detail, it allows you to make meaningful contributions to the work in a way that is fully supported by adults. So we look forward to some useful information that will be shared today, as well as um, getting some youth experiences from our uh, guest panelists for today as well. So just a couple of things. Um, Shane covered some of this, but uh, you are muted as you, as you enter. So um, you might wanna check your computer audio volume and enable speaker if you're having trouble hearing. Um, and if you have other technical issues, feel free to enter it into the chat or to message um, Shane or, or one of us directly um, for, for assistance. Also, if you're comfortable, we would love for you all to share your video. Um, and throughout the presentation, uh, feel free to input either questions or uh, reactions, comments in the chat box, and we will address them either during the presentation or towards the end. So before we get into the presentation, we do have a quick poll. We would like to see, um, of those of you on the, on the call, have you all tried any specific youth engagement strategies? And if so, um, go ahead and check the types of strategies that you, you've used to try to engage youth. So um, we should be seeing a poll uh, come up and it's a check all that apply. Do we have that poll showing? There we go. So just take a moment if you have any um, experience engaging youth in any of the, the listed, the ways that are listed here. And if you checked other, go ahead and put in the chat, um, what are some other ways that you've engaged youth in your programming? We'll give it a few more seconds. All right. Okay. I think we can go ahead and close it. All right. So it seems like uh, many of you have been working with social media to engage youth. Um, some of you also have youth ambassadors or an advisory council. Um, and then some have no specific strategies. So um, we, so hopefully you'll find this uh, presentation helpful um, to continue to think about how you can engage youth in meaningful ways. Great. All right, and so an additional question for you. What do you hope to learn from today's webinar? And go ahead and put in the chat what you hope to, to get out of today's webinar. Some have um, experience engaging youth, um, but there are many different ways to engage youth strategies to effectively engage youth, hearing new ideas. Mm -hmm. Yep, new strategies and ideas. Yep, effectively engaging youth, engaging youth for hybrid programming, add to peer education programming. Great, great. These are all um, great strategies and um, 
and I'm sure that our presenters today will um, be able to address some of those. Um, so moving right along, uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead and hand it over to our presenter for today, um, Eric Pitcher, and um, they can also introduce our, our youth panelists that we are excited to hear from today as well. So um, go ahead and Hi take everybody. it away. everybody. Thanks, Chloe. So um, welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Eric Pitcher. I am the Director of Youth Programs here at Foster Club. We are headquartered in Seaside, Oregon, with a remote office also in the D.C. metro area. If you're not familiar with our work, uh, we are the National Network for Young People in Foster Care. We're in our 21st year, and we work extensively in youth adult partnerships and youth adult ally uh, relationships to meaningful engage young people who have lived experience in foster care. So that's a little bit about us. I am going to go ahead and pass it over uh, to, well, actually, wait, let's go over the little graphic here and then we'll have our um, uh, panelists introduce themselves. So what you've got on your screen now is a, a leverage, right? This idea, can we flip back just one um, to the lever back one more? There we go. Okay, so um, a part of what um, I wanted to share with you is to get a metaphor in your minds of what could leveraging youth adult partnerships look like, youth adult allyships look like. So all of you are carrying a load, right, which is the grant that you are working on, right, with key deliverables and outcomes and change that you're trying to make in young people's lives. Right? And we can put a lot of efforts into that, except you don't have to do that work alone. Right, You can partner with young people to do peer education work. And I'm seeing some folks already letting us know that they do peer education work or um, are looking for some strategies to try to engage young people. So when I think about the load that we are all carrying, there are lots of ways that we can lighten that load by partnering with young people to exert a lot of effort. So what we're trying to do is balance the load with effort. Now, the other thing is that sometimes we have a lot of young people who want to come support our work and do our work with us. So we've got a lot of effort, but not enough structure to actually allow for folks to make the contributions that are going to be most beneficial. Right, so we've got a, a lever that's doing this thing. Sometimes our load is so heavy and we don't have quite enough staff, right? And we need our effort to be broadened out. And that's a place where young people can come in and contribute. So peer-to-peer -peer education, particularly around sensitive topics like adolescent development, sexual health and well-being, pregnancy prevention. These are all spaces where peers can have a conversation with peers that an adult-to-peer conversation, adult-to-young person conversation is just not gonna land. So as you're thinking about your work with young people, I hope this image is helpful. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Corey and we'll go to our next slide. And Corey, go ahead and do your intro and then uh, Justice is next and I is on deck. Hey, hi everybody, my name is Corey Seller. I use the he, him and his pronouns and I have five years of experience in the state of Kansas foster care system. I am a 2021 Foster Club All-Star intern and I'm really looking forward to being able to share some ideas with y'all and help y'all with your efforts. I am Justice Callisto. I use the pronouns pan, pans, and pan selves. I currently live in the beautiful Green Mountains of Vermont. I am also a 2021 All-Star intern. And I really hope to be able to share my thoughts, my opinion, and my experience with all of you and get you guys to learn some more stuff. Hey everyone, my name is Ayal Tintawi. Um, I'm 18 years old and I come to you from Michigan, born and raised. I use the she, her, hers pronouns and I have about four years of experience in um, Michigan's foster care system. I too, like Justice and Corey, am a 2021 All-Star intern and I'm really excited to be here with y'all and just have this important conversation with everyone. And I will pass it back over to Justice, I believe. And we're ready for our next slide to go over the agenda. All right, so for the agenda for today, we will be doing a discussion with uh, for youth and adult partnerships 
um, talking about the L LEX Ally Partnership Framework, the case examples, youth engagement online, constituent, con 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 constituent engagement tool. Um, we'll also have the LEX leader panel, the self-reflection and sharing, additional tools, a Q&A, and then the closing. And yes, the LEX stands for lived experience leadership, or yeah, leadership. And I believe we, I will be passing it back to Eric now for the objectives. Yeah, thanks, Justice. Uh, so our objectives today. Uh, so some of you have already placed some of the things that you'd like to learn into the chat. We're going to get to some of those things. We've got a Q&A. We've got a panel plan for you. And so don't worry. Um, we'll try to get to as many of those topics as you all would like to get to uh, as we can. All right. So here uh, today, we're really trying to define what it means to be an ally to young people and why that's important in your programming. I think you probably already know why it's important, but let's talk a little bit about meaning and some theory, and then we'll talk about some practices. We're also going to describe the youth adult allyship framework that we're using at Foster Club, which is an adaptation from the um, tight pyramid, and it's building off of the original work by heart, but we can get there in just a sec. We're going to discuss how to implement trainings and youth engagement in a virtual setting, which is what Foster Club has been doing since Last year, when the pandemic visited upon us, um, we needed to quickly uh, retool and begin to engage young people in online settings, which we had not done before. So we are also new to this and potentially you could teach us a thing, um, but we'll share some of the things that we've learned and how, um, how to maybe avoid some of those problems. Uh, we'll also identify and apply some tools to creatively engage young people and build youth leadership capacity. And then finally, talk a little bit about the benefits of meaningful youth engagement, particularly from the perspective of young people themselves. So we can go ahead and move to our next slide. And Corey, go ahead and introduce this thing. Okay, so again, hi, everybody. So this is the LEX LA partnership. This is the Wong's type pyramid. I don't know if y'all have heard of this before, but basically it was developed by Nama Wong, Mark Zimmerman, and Edith Parker. It's the Typology of Youth Participation and Empowerment, or TYPE Pyramid, and it provides evidence-based model of youth perspective and participation that builds on previous civic engagement framework, but incorporates more recent findings in positive youth adult participation research. The model illustrates three categorical types of participation, adult control, youth control, and share control. So adult control and youth control are placed on the same level. You know, it indicates relatively equal levels of empowerment while shared control is elevated above the youth and adult control, which indicates that degrees of empowerment increase for, bo for both youth and adult as participatory activities ascend towards more optimal forms of youth adult partnerships. So I'm going to hand it over to Eric to kind of talk about the different things within the type pyramid. Yeah, thank you, Corey. So um, uh, building from what Corey has just said, most of us who are working in child welfare, myself included, I do not have lived experience in the child welfare system, but I work with lots of people who do have lived experience. The other way that we might think about the ally side of this um, pyramid is that I am now an adult and the people whom I work with are considerably younger. And as I continue to age, um, the gap between me and the young people that I work with is wider and wider and wider. That doesn't mean that we don't have relatively similar levels of empowerment though as we enter into projects. So part of what uh, we wanted to share with you all today is getting up into this space that's called pluralistic. That pluralistic space is where youth have a voice and an active participant role in whatever activity is going on. Youth and adults are sharing control and power in the work that we're doing. So when we have shared control, Part of what that means is that uh, the adult ally person has set up some guardrails and is saying, all right, here's what we need to do. This is the box that we're going to play in. These are some tools and strategies. How shall we proceed from there? And then that gives space for our lived experience leaders, young people that we're working with to come into that sandbox with us, pick up the tools that make sense for them, start to use them in the ways that make sense for them so that we can ultimately reach other young people. So we partner in this way to help reach uh, other young people in foster care in particular. Now, one caution about this is that many times in youth work, and probably you've said this and thought it yourself, is that we want it to be youth-led. 
that's not a bad thing. That's a wonderful intention and a beautiful desire. Part of the challenge is that many of our young people are not actually yet ready to lead. So we've got to build capacity for them to be able to lead. So when we think about the autonomous space that's in the lower right corner, that's what I think we mean by youth led, right? All the youth are deciding, they have all kinds of um, decision making, but that's actually can be a dicey space for young people because they don't necessarily have the, the tools, experience in order to truly lead in the ways that we often need them to lead in a project if they were gonna be fully autonomous. The other problem that we can run into is that it's all adults all the time. Right, so adults are saying every single thing that should happen. Uh, there's not a lot of youth voice and participation and adults have total control. So part of what I would caution us is that on the extremes of this, there are problems in both of those places. However, there are also times when it makes sense for us to be working in that mode. So for example, I, I don't know about you all, but when a building is on fire, I don't really wanna have a conversation and build leadership competency with a young person about what we should do. I want adults to have a plan and that we will exit the building in a safe way. Now that's of course uh, an extreme example, but I think it tries to make the point that there are some things that are best handled at the sort of ally level. And there are some things that are best handled by our lived experience leaders. So one of the ways this shows up in our work at Foster Club is that we are contracted by states to do youth events for independent living providers and a variety of other um, uh, program participants. In that, within the container of that, what we try to do is make space for young people to say, this is what I think ought to happen as an opening activity. This is what I think ought to happen on our playlist. These are topics I think we should talk about during lunch. This is how I'd like to approach talking to my peers about mental health. So that's a more autonomous version, but it requires a lot of leadership buildup and capacity building. And so we'll get a little bit more into that. So if you have any questions as we're moving through things, please don't hesitate to drop them into the chat. If we're going too fast and you'd like for us to slow down, um, please let us know and we'll go back over anything that would help you to better understand what we're sharing. So we are ready to go to our next slide, Chloe. Thank you. So this is our approach infographic. So this is how Foster Club does our work. So you may have heard of our work and most likely the thing that you've heard is that you've seen a person show up at a conference in a yellow shirt, uh, or maybe you've seen a person show up on a Zoom call in a yellow shirt and that person is doing some stuff. They might be educating, they might be providing some perspective, um, they might be advocating for system improvement, they may be increasing the awareness of the need for um, high quality foster parents, could be any number of activities. Uh, but what we are known for probably most is our all-star internship program. That's a fairly small slice of the work that we do and a fairly narrow view of what our lived experience leaders do. So if you look at the column that's labeled approach, we have a model that is based and rooted in lived experience leadership. That is important to us. We wanna see young people working with their peers uh, and supporting them. So part of the ways that we work with lived experience leaders is through peer support and navigation, as well as creating spaces for young people to exercise voice and agency in system change. So part of the how is lived experience leaders might come through the door of peer support or come through the door of system change. And then we'll do some of the multicolored boxes that you see there in the middle, the how, how is it delivered? So training and ed for young people, resources and navigation, um, our mentoring and club programs, uh, public policy advocacy, practice improvement, and of course, public awareness. And all of that is really to benefit all of the young people who experience foster care. So our beneficiary is everyone in foster care, some of whom will be engaged with us at a slightly higher level and will become our lived experience leaders. So that's the way that we do our work. Lived experience leaders are integrated into every aspect of our organization that makes sense for us at this time. So there are some limits on that. Um, so for example, on our board of directors, we've got about half of the folks with lived experience. They tend to be a little bit older. So they may be former all-stars, they may be um, former policy council members, but they have a little bit of years and experience on them. And then they would come on the board. Our board is 51% lived experience leaders actually trends a little higher than that, but that's the bylaw mandate is at least half lived experience leaders. Uh, so another place where we have been very cautious about engaging lived experience leaders is in our hiring. 
So it's not a place that we have typically engaged lived experience leaders, but in nearly every other aspect of the organization, including our strategic plan goals, our um, policies and procedures related to justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, lived experience leaders are consulted on all of those matters. So uh, building from there, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about some cases that'll help us to generate some ideas about how to engage young people uh, in virtual environments in particular. So Aya. Yes, so the first case we have, a youth joins the call, but when an icebreaker question gets asked, there is silence. You feel like you're talking into the void. The chat starts to light up with responses, but no one actually unmutes themselves and talks. So what would you do to get increased engagement? Feel free to unmute <laughs> and let us know your ideas, drop it in the chat. But if you were faced with this type of scenario, what would you do to get increased engagement? I can jump in. Um, my name is Renisha Bratton and I'm with the Riverside Community Health Foundation. Um, in these spaces, we one, um, always let them know that they can feel free to leave comments in the chat, but we may even open up the icebreaker with um, giving an example ourselves just to make them feel comfortable in the room and hearing just someone in the room share first um, and acknowledging those who do leave things in the chat as a comment um, if we're getting low participation in the virtual space. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great one. Um, a lot of time there is probably some fear and anxiety around being the first person to speak up and answer the question, especially if um, you don't know your fellow um, participants. So having someone on your team answer the question first would be a great way to go ahead and break the ice, so to speak. <laughs> what else? Any other thoughts? Something that we do in um, as foster club interns in our workshops is we would actually call on people specifically by their names um, and be like, hey, do you have anything you want to add on? Especially if we haven't heard from them at all. Um, you know, sometimes we do like three day conferences. So if we haven't heard from them in the previous days, then we'll call on them. Um, sometimes we'll type in the chat or private message them um, if they want to share out something. Does anyone else have any ideas of how we can get increased parts or increased engagement? Um, one idea would be to give them a scenario to answer, like say, call um, a specific person out, give them a scenario and ask them how they will work through that certain scenario. And that just, it kind of gets them engaged in our program. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing. All right, if no one else would like to share their ideas, I will pass it on to Corey to go over the next example. All right, thank you. I, uh, so youth join the call, but they have so much background noise, no one can hear. You're getting reluctant to mute people, but you're getting, you're, you're reluctant to mute people, but you're getting an echo and everyone's ears are about to bleed. So how can you communicate your expectations to them? Because obviously we don't want to come off as rude. So how would you guys want to communicate your expectations? And kind of like before, you can unmute yourself or you can drop it in the chat. Uh, I'll take that one too. Um, one of the things we do is we ask them first what their expe expectations are of us. Then we give them our expectations of them so that way they know. And then when we notice that um, there's a continuance with them uh, breaking some of our expectations, we just kind of remind them, remind them, hey, guys, remember when we talked about on our first meeting expectations, just a reminder, so and so, so and so. That way no one feels like they're called out, but it brings the attention to what the situation is. Yeah, that's a really good way to handle it. Does anybody else have anything? Hi, this is Courtney. Um, this is something that happens a lot in my groups um, because everybody's at home with their <laughs> siblings and dogs and everything. Um, I found that a lot of times my other students, depending on how long we've been together, will sort of police or not police, sort of uh, call each other out a little bit like, hey, can you mute? Um, but in addition to what, uh, is it Brianna? Brianna? Um, in addition to what you said, um, I find that writing in chat or texting the student individually, like, hey, just so you know, your background is kind of loud. You want to mute for a few minutes until you move to a different room, just so they don't feel called out. 
Okay. Yeah, that's really good. Does anybody else have anything? Thank you, Courtney. Thank you. Is it is it Brianna? Awesome. Thank you both. Here we have Judith. You can make group agreements. Um, Vicky, we create group norms and include that as an example. When finished, then we ask the group can agree to the forms. Okay, yeah, so it seems like you all kind of have the, the same idea, just playing out different ways. That's really awesome. Thank you all for sharing. So yes, and Eric, also just letting folks know in advance about the kind of setting they need to be in. Yes, so with that being said, we're gonna move on to a kind of similar example with case number three with justice. All righty. So in case, case example number three, youth are regularly, re, blah, regularly in their cars or otherwise mobile when on a Zoom call. When asked to be in a stationary position, some youth are a bit reluctant. How can you help youth engage more fully? Hmm. So um, I know one thing that I've done um, in past conferences and stuff that I've done is kind of just communicating, you, you know, your concerns about, you know, being mobile and maybe being distracting, you know, just even having a one on one conversation, like in a private chat or something and be like, hey, you know, this is you know, these are my concerns and stuff like that, I think is a really, you know, great idea um, to do. Also, um, you know, if they're the ones driving and they're on Zoom, you know, it's that whole, you know, don't text while driving. It's kind of the same thing of, you know, don't be on a video chat while you're driving or going somewhere because it's not really safe. Yeah, and it could also wrap into the group agreements as well. I agree with that, Eric. But does anyone have any thoughts on this one? Justice, can I also add, this is Courtney again. Um, I've had that happen a few times too, where students are driving. And I love that they're participating via video, but like you said, if they are driving or even if they're out, I know sometimes we can't always be sitting in front of our computer, you know, doing just the one thing. So if they are gonna be moving around or with a lot of other people, sometimes I'll ask them just to put like a, a picture of their face for that like 10 minutes or so that they're out and about and then come back on when they're um, fully, um, available. Yeah, so like they can still hear, but maybe, you know, hold off on actually, you know, saying things and doing all that till they get to their destination. Yeah, so they, we, they can hear everything going on, but also like instead of like the crazy like moving background, it would just be like their face for just a bit. Yes, that is a great idea, actually. I love that idea. Any last minute thoughts? Um, if not, I'm actually going to be passing it back to Corey for the next example. Hi, everybody, me again. So um, we have another example for everybody. So this is example number four. So youth are super passionate about a topic and are just jumping in and cross talking and cutting each other off. Folks can't hear perspectives and they're getting frustrated. So what can you do to bring some order and validate the perspective shared? Because obviously you're gonna be kind of reluctant to shut it down if people are actually, because let's face it with Zoom, it's really hard to get people to want to actually do things. So what can you do? Like, what can you do to bring some order and make sure that they know they're heard and understood, but maybe let's let's wait a little bit. Um, one idea would be if sometimes they, they ramble along, I, I hate to use that word, but, um, and then this, when different conversations start to come up, you try to, um, what we try to do is bring it back to the topic at hand, but reiterating something that they said that addressed the topic. So that way we can continue the conversation, but it's on what we are, um, the main idea of what we're uh, discussing. Okay, awesome. I like that. Thank you, Brianna. Is there anybody else? Oh, Vicki, um, group agreements include active listening and just remind them. Yeah, that's true. Anything else? This is Rainisha from RCHF. We also use our uh, Zoom backgrounds as like a sounding board. So we'll have up like ground rules just as a visual reminder uh, when we're in calls with the youth and we'll go over them at the start of our meetings, but then also validating what a youth has said. Um, so similar to the one who's the, the lady who spoke before me, uh, we'll go off of like something important they said 
And then also say we want to give other people in the room a chance to speak. So it's not discrediting their input, but then also opening up the room um, for other youth to speak. Okay, yes. Um, thank you for sharing that. And yes, like Eric said, have the signal for land the plane, which kind of means, you know, get to the point, have youth raise their hands to be called on. Uh, I, I personally also like the idea of breakout rooms, but that's just in general, because I feel like, especially since nothing's really in person, it gets you that chance to have a, you know, a little bit more of a connection with the, with whatever youth you're working with, you can build more of a bond that way. Also, if folks haven't had a chance to offer a strategic sharing workshop, this can help our sharers know what to share and what not to share. Yes, because there's sometimes you just, you get excited and you don't stop rambling. I do that all the time. <laughs> so, Eric, oh, I was just gonna say, Eric, could you offer like a little bit more of an example of what you mean by a strategic sharing workshop? What yeah, is sure. So this is a kind of standard child welfare um, practice and we use it here at Foster Club. It's called strategic sharing. Uh, lots of folks use this and you haven't, if you have not um, become familiar with it, basically it's a way for young people who have experienced foster care, but could have experienced lots of other things as well, to start to take ownership over their story again, and to be mindful of what they share and when they share it. So who am I talking to? How will the audience off ultimately benefit from some of the things that I'm sharing right now? And then what do I need to kind of keep private? So are there details that should be private? How do you get your message and point across without sharing too much? So we use a stoplight for this. So it's sort of like, oh, you're getting into red territory or oh, we're bumping up against yellow or green is good to go, keep going. So once you have that um, stoplight in place with folks, you can kind of remind them like, boy, it feels like we're getting a little bit into yellow ter territory. How's everybody feeling about this conversation so far? And then once um, folks have gone into the red territory, we can say like, oh boy, we're at red, uh, so we're gonna go ahead and wrap up that part of the story and the sharing and uh, try to get us back onto some safer topics. So um, this helps folks to know why they're sharing, what they're sharing and the purpose behind it. So that's one suggestion. Another suggestion I would offer is that if you've got, a, so some groups of young people, you've got a bunch of talkers, you've got a bunch of silent folks and those talker folks tend to outweigh some of the silent folks or the quieter folks, right, who need to be drawn out. So one of the strategies that we've been using is to brainstorm in Google Docs. Uh, so we pull that up on a shared screen or we use the whiteboard function in Zoom so that folks can put a bunch of their ideas in. This helps our folks who are processing internally. They're with us. They're really present. They're hearing us. The stuff is landing. But they're just not someone who can get their words out that fast. So the document um, brainstorm can be helpful, right? So sometimes we'll say, all right, we're gonna do um, five minutes of just quiet brainstorming so that everybody can get in there and do their thing and make their contribution. In, and then we'll start to discuss. So it gives our um, chatty folks a way to contribute and it gives our quieter folks a way to um, step up and still have their ideas reflected. So I really like that strategy if that's available to you all. Um, and then maybe one final strategy I would suggest is that we've had a lot of success creating stacks in our facilitation or a little list, right? So if I was on a call right now and I see that uh, Katie and Renisha and Corey all want to share, then I would create a little stack and I would say, okay, Katie's up, then we're going to go to Renisha and then we're going to go to Corey. And then we'll start a new stack, right? So I keep stacks at maybe three, four people because I'll just forget their names. But creating a stack like that can help folks know I've got a position in the line and I'm going to be called on. Um, and it lets other folks know like, oh, if I want it in, I could let somebody know and they'll put me in the list. So a couple ideas for you there. I will hand it on over to Aya. Thank you, Eric. So our last and final example Youth are leading a session with their peers. Every time the youth go into breakout sessions, they are supposed to lead the conversations, but seemingly forget their instructions and tasks. They click the help button on Zoom, but it can only be in one place at a time. So what can you do to make the task in breakout rooms clearer? You can go ahead and unmute, drop it in the chat. But what are some ideas? Um, one idea is we use a strategy called they're getting there, not there. So just check it in with them and ask them at, um, what, what process they're at. So are you there where you know what's going on and you know what you're supposed to be doing? 
or are you getting there where it's a, it's a little um, confusion and you need a little help or not there at all, meaning I'm, I'm not sure I've forgotten. Then we can help them and that um, you can put it in the chat privately where they don't feel like they're called out. That's a big thing that we have with the kids not wanting to feel like they're um, called out. But with those strategies, I noticed that they, they'll respond honestly and they don't, have, they don't feel embarrassed about it. Yeah, that's a really great one. And I like how everyone's saying that um, they don't want to call out anyone. They message, they put it in the chat. That's also a very great way to show the youth that um, like help them feel like they're in a safe space and just that, you know, we're here to support them. Um, another one that is that I personally find really helpful. Yes, like Courtney just said, um, write the prompts in a shared doc so you can refer back to that. Add the prompt instructions in the breakout chat. So that's what it's, I find that personally very helpful having the um, instructions in the chat, just because I know there are a lot of people like me who need to reread things to just, you know, have it be processed and like actually to see it in writing as opposed to just hearing it. Um, and then Eric said, we similarly, we use the percent ready indicator, but percent ready are you for this opportunity? So yeah, that's also a really great example. Elena said, put instructions in the chat. Thanks for modeling this. <laughs> of course, glad I could help. Um, yeah, these are all really great ones. If we don't have any last minute ideas, we will hand it back over to Eric. Okay, so why don't I, um, why don't we flip to our next um, slide? So um, let, let me read this to you. So this is a little internet meme. Me, this show is boring, boss. Again, this is a Zoom conference. So if you've been on a snooze fest of a Zoom conference, um, we've got some ideas to help you kind of jumpstart the excitement for that, some of which you've already seen actually in what we're doing. So part of our foster club model is not to say like, these are the 15 things that you should be doing to engage youth, because I can't actually tell you that, right? You know your youth, you know your local context, and you know what your objectives are in your role. And so I can't actually give you a set list. I'm going to share some stuff that we use that may be helpful to you. Um, so let's go ahead and flip to that next slide and talk a little bit about the importance of hype. Um, so hyping up young people, that's sort of the background of this whole thing, right, is that um, many times there's nerves or anxiety or shyness or things, internal stuff to young people that prevents their engagement in an online space. But if we create a, a hype, fun, exciting, and engaging environment, you're going to start to see young people opening up. Maybe you've seen little windows of this in your work and you'd like to see more of that. And so we're going to give you a couple tools to help you figure out how to do that. So one of the strategies that we use is to play music. At the beginning of this call, there was a little intro music. We usually pick something super upbeat to kind of get us started. And then we will call out to folks like, hey, any songs stuck in your head, any recommendations? So as you know, on Zoom, a lot of times you're like, oh, I got to get my windows. I got a million tabs. I'm running this thing. And I got a chat in the background. And maybe I got a Microsoft Teams chat thing over here and whatever else it is that you're, you have up. We've got 1 million D windows, right? And so part of what um, needs to happen is that you got to get yourself collected, right? And if you play a song, a uh, video yesterday, we were on a call doing our pre-orientation for our um, All-Stars. Everybody wanted to listen to Lizzo. So we put on a Lizzo song. Uh, and that gave me the minutes that I needed in order to get my stuff kind of together so I could be a little bit better participant in that call. So it buys you some time uh, and it helps to engage the young people because they're listening to the song and dancing along on their, um, on their end. So that's one piece. Another thing that I would recommend is Kahoot. It's a learning game. Have folks seen it? Um, and you can use a reaction or um, drop in the chat. So Kahoot is a, a learning game. It can also be used for various kinds of trivia. It is super engaging and fun. It comes with its own music. It comes with a bunch of different kinds of um, questions that you can use. It, many young people have actually used it in schools, but they don't have a negative, uh, they don't have a negative association with it that they sometimes have with school. So Kahoot is seen as a fun kind of activity and you get a winner. It helps us to, um, it helps us also to identify people to get prizes I'm and we use a lot of incentives, a little bit of cash. The Department for Public Health. Um, there's a grant that today is the submission deadline. Oh, I was like, wait, Lisa, is that for us? Um, so, okay. Um, so anyway, so on the um, Kahoot, it's a learning game. It's super fun. Um, you can get, uh, we have a bunch of free ones. So if you want to try it out, um, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We'll give you them for free. Um, so we've got a bunch of them. They're super fun to play. 
Um, we've got music trivia, we've got health stuff, we've got college access stuff. So any content can be put into Kahoot and it's a really fun game. All right, so that's that. Um, you all saw the use of polls. We also use um, poll everywhere embedded in PowerPoint slides. We also use a software called Mentimeter that will help. That's a really great brainstorming if you're trying to like get a bunch of ideas out. And then I've also seen folks use like a, um, a couple of Google uh, tools. So I think that's another um, way that you can start to get opinions or ideas without having to wait for folks to unmute and share their ideas. And then I think the last piece is our little emoji up in the corner is we need to have fun. Childhood, young adulthood, these are fun times to be alive and they should be fun, right? We've all just been surviving this pandemic together and we've got a lot of ambiguous loss and trauma around that. And so we need fun as an antidote to some of the hard stuff that's going on. Um, and if you're like me, um, you know that good youth engagement doesn't always have to be super serious. It can be fun, it can be playful, and that's a really important element. So when we build an agenda for something, uh, it could be a meeting, it could be a prep session, we always add a fun element. So our standard agenda has like intro icebreaker, What's our fun play element? How are we going to play together? How are we going to have that youthful spirit? Um, and then uh, what's the actual business of the thing that we need to do? And then how do we have a meaningful closer? So folks know what to expect. It's a super trauma-informed practice so that folks know exactly what's expected of them, when it's expected of them. They get the agenda in advance. They know exactly what's going on, right? And um, Brianna, what you're talking about with the gift cards, we use that attached to the Kahoot. So somebody who wins gets the um, gets the gift card. So it gives them a reason to play and to be accurate. All right, so why don't we go ahead and flip over to our panel? Because I know Aya has a few things that you need to attend to later today because you've got a busy life. So let's go ahead and get into this panel. So I'd love to get us started with Aya talking a little bit about the support role that staff play in the All-Star Internship. Yeah, absolutely. So the All-Star Internship starts off with a six week training in the summer. And those first two weeks of that six week is more um, intense for us, where we actually learn how to facilitate workshops, how to support um, youth, how to just be an all-star, you know, how to, just how to be there for others. Um, and then after that, it's where we actually start doing different projects. We do different um, conferences. So like, for example, I know Corey and Justice and I, we were I believe we were all on, the, on a Montana conference. We were on an Oregon one. Um, and so those are completely all-star interns led. Um, we have, it's like we facilitate the entire workshop from start to finish. We'll have the um, staff be there for like support in case anything comes up, um, in case any of the youth on the conferences need um, something that us interns are not, um, what's the word? like we're, we're not prepped enough for, we can't really, we don't have the experience to help them out with that, then they're there for that. Um, they help us out with like technology type of things. So um, screen sharing, things like that. And just kind of supporting us and being there for us if we ever have any questions along the way, um, especially since we do juggle a bunch of like different projects all at once. It's not like where one week is one project, the next week's a separate project. We're doing multiple projects all at once. So they're kind of just there to support us along the way. Um, we need anything they just they all everyone wants to see each other succeed and so we just yeah they're I feel like I hope I kind of answered the question I kind of went on a little bit of a tangent but yeah everyone's great we all support each other so <laughs> thanks Aya and um Corey or uh Justice would you like to add anything to what Aya's just shared uh, yeah, I will. So a lot, like Aya said, there is a lot of support, but it's also the mental health support that we get from the staff that is super helpful. Because like I said before, it's all on Zoom. Like me, I live alone. So whenever I get off my computer for the day, I just have my dog here and I sit on the couch and watch TV or something. And so there's a lot of stuff that we do that often deals with like the heavier topics. And like, um, like there's one about racism and there's, you know, one about grief and loss. And a lot of this stuff has some heavy stuff that goes with it that can, you know, you really can take home with you. And just like, I know me personally, I've also had some, like I've had my, my younger brother, he passed away during the internship and I had all of the, all of the staff reached out to me. They offered, you know, if you need someone to talk to I'm here and they were just super helpful and just, 
they were all there with that emotional support to help me through everything and through just all of it that, yeah, like we're all here to help each other. We're all here to help each other succeed. We all want to see each other succeed. And yeah, Justice, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I'll add a, a little bit. You guys, I mean, both you and I have said pretty much what I would say too. Um, I also had a, a few, you know, mental health things kind of come up for me that made it a little rough. But, you know, I continued to reach out to coaches, to staff, and, you know, they helped me through it all. And even though I had so many, I had a really bad case of, you know, the imposter syndrome, I honestly didn't really think I belonged as being an all-star. And, you know, by the end of the six weeks, I, I disagreed with everything I originally thought about myself when entering this internship. And a lot of it was from my peers and um, uh, my coaches that I've, I talked to, all of the coaches, all of the staff, everyone that I had contact with, you know, they all helped me see that, you know, I don't need to be, I don't need to have any self-doubt because I'm an amazing human being. And it's just really helped me grow as an individual, but also helped, helped me to grow my own advocacy career that I have here in my home state. And every time we talk about, you know, the uh, 2021 session A All-Stars, the first thing that pops in my head is We Are Family. You know, it's a great song, but it, it really is like kind of, we've become a little family. We all support everyone, no matter what. Thanks, Justice. Um... Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, power. So one of the things that um, we need to get real about is that there's power uh, happening in between our relationships between um, young people and professional staff, right? There's a power dynamic there. And our ideal situation is that we're sharing power, we're being really frank about it. Uh, that's not always what happens and we get it wrong sometimes and there's some ways that we can work through that. Um, but when you think about the internship, uh, what are some ways that you think about sharing power with staff uh, that might help this audience? And I think Corey is going to take the lead on this one, right? Yeah, I will. So kind of like I said before, the staff and the coaches are just always there to help us. And a lot of the power split, it's, it's really 50-50. Because like Aya had said, the first two weeks, we're the ones participating in the groups and the workshops that we lead later on in the next four weeks. So we know what it's like to be an audience member. And so a lot of times, like Eric had put in the chat, the coaches, they're prior all-stars who came to help. And so they've also taught the workshop and have gone through the workshop. And so they're always there to offer support. They're always there to offer the help. They're normally it's, you know, like we'll lead like safe, like we talked about cahoots. We will like talk about the Kahoot, list the answers, get the youth engaged, have fun with it. And a coach or staff member will be back making all the technology stuff happen, doing the thing for it to make sure that everything's running smoothly. Because I know I am terrible with technology like a 90 year old man and wouldn't be able to do half of the stuff that the coaches do. And so a lot of the power stuff, it's just 50 50. You have a say in everything you do. You have the right to say no. They don't, there's the thing they call no, no force participation. They don't force you to do anything you're not comfortable with. I was asked to do a group on grief. Like I said, it was like two weeks after my brother passed away and I wasn't ready for it. And I just voiced that and they're like, okay, that's fine. You don't have to and found somebody else. And another thing I like about it is, you know, you're not afraid to, while yes, they are technically, I guess, a little higher up than you are, you don't feel that way. It just, like just I said, it just feels like we're a family, like we're all best friends. None of us have even met in person and it was only six weeks, but we were all crying last week when we had to end. I mean, it's just, you make best friends and it's not really like I have a boss. It was, you know, you have friends and family. Tender stuff, Corey, thank you. So, the last question for the panel really is this recipe, this success thing that we're trying to do also hinges on you. So what do interns need to do in order to be successful in a virtual program like our all-star program is currently? Uh, I can uh, start with that one. So for me specifically, like I said, I had a huge thing with that whole imposter syndrome. I had a lot of really 
my self doubt about myself was, it was really horrible. And it was really holding me back from being the best version of me I could be. And, you know, being able to perform really well in my facilitation and just in group in general. Um, I actually almost didn't really make any friends or anything or really any connections because I had some, that self-doubt was right there. And, um, and even though I had that, I've always said I'm really good at masking what's really going on with me because I've had so much practice. I'm 22. I've been, you know, masking things since I was like 12. And, and Eric was actually the one who had brought it up to me. And I was like, hey, do you know this is kind of how you are, we see you right now? Or this is what I've noticed. And even though I thought I was hiding it, I apparently wasn't. And the when Eric had told me all of that, it actually was like, okay, it like a part of me was like, okay, obviously something needs to change because I really don't want to leave here, you know, regretting not being as successful as I could be. So literally from then on, I was doing as much as I possibly could to get out of my comfort zone. Um, and the staff were always right there. Eric was there. Um, a few other people were there. And even Corey was there, actually, because I was telling him, I'm like, this is way out of my comfort zone. And Corey was like, stop it. Because basically, was, he's over there and telling me, you know, you're going to do perfectly fine. If you need help, I'm there. I can take over when needed. And, you know, just having that support it and just hearing that honesty and everything from everyone around me is what helped me to be as successful as I am and has really gotten me out of my comfort zone and even taught me more things about myself I didn't know. And it, it, it was great. <laughs> I lost my train of thought, but it was great. Thank you, Justice. So um, in the interest of time, let's go ahead and move into our um, self-reflection question. Um, so Justice, if you wanna drop that into chat, I'd love to hear folks' thoughts about this particular question. How might I use the information shared in this webinar to further engage the youth in my programs? Hi, I'm Peggy. Um, I was just going to say, I have heard of Cahoots before, and I keep forgetting to use it because I hear such great things about it. And I think it would be a huge uh, asset for our, our groups. I think kids would absolutely love it. Um, so I have done everything but tattoo it on my arm to make sure that we remember to start using that because I just feel like it's it's really a, a really good tool to get kids engaged because the more fun you make it, obviously, the, the more... Um, the more the youth will respond. So thank you for that. Hello, I can add, I really like the strategic sharing method that was presented here today. Um, just taking that back to the team to see how we can incorporate that with the youth groups and in our uh, upcoming events, I think was really, really beneficial. I like the idea of the music to loosen them up a little bit because sometimes it can be a, a woosaw for them depending on what kind of day they've had. So that I really uh, took that into consideration. So thank you. Great, thank you all so much. Did anyone else wanna share? Oh, folks have said utilizing more icebreakers. Oh my gosh, Elena, we use this exact same question. We use a bunch of um, like, would you rather questions? Um, and then there's a version of it that you can play on Zoom that's a bet on the crowd version. So folks need to say like, what would they personally want? 
And then we also guess on what do we think the crowd is going to go with. Um, but this um, sweat maple syrup or the spaghetti hair thing, this is like a legendary question, right? And so that kind of stuff is super useful. I know some folks were super interested in that strategic sharing workshop. It's actually available for free. That piece of curriculum is free to you um, on our website. So I've dropped the link for strategic sharing. So if you'd like to actually see um, that curriculum and use it, you can. Um, the strategic sharing workshop is designed to be led by a young person. Um, and so I'd encourage you to download it and use it. Uh, it can be applied to any group of young people that you're working with. Um, but was intentionally made for young people with a foster care background. Eric, how do you get the version with the crowd? Is it just oh, like yeah, a bet on the crowd? We have some instructions on it actually. So um, I'm not sure if you all typically send out um, like a follow up email after the webinar, but I can we give do. you the we've got a virtual guide on how to do bet on the crowd. You can set it up in Kahoot. You can also set it up in like a Zoom polling kind of feature. You can also kind of do a survey in advance and then folks just do the bet on the crowd part of it in the live version. But we've got some instructions and a whole bunch of kind of cringy questions. Um, so it's, it's kind of a fun icebreaker, but also it's a little bit cringy. So it gives the group something to bond about. Um, yeah. So of like, awesome. oh my goodness, I can't believe that. Another really controversial, would you rather like put your cereal in the bowl first or your milk in the bowl first? Very controversial. Um, not sure why, but extremely controversial question. <laughs> I've also heard that controversy around flossing before or after you brush your teeth. <laughs> so mm -hmm. lots of different yeah. fun things to try. All right, so why don't we go ahead and talk about a couple more tools to support your practice. So we have dropped the link to strategic sharing, so please use that. Um, and then I shared with you on the slides the um, partnership graphic, as well as our approach infographic. And we're going to drop a couple files into um, the chat right now for you, which is our principles of Lex Leader engagement and our constituent voices in uh, services assessment. So let me tell you just a little bit about our principles for Lex Leader engagement, and those are coming at you right now. Thank you, Corey. So on the lived experience engagement principle, I'm just going to pick up a couple of these, right? So one of the things that we've already talked about is being honest about power. What decisions do young people get to make and what decisions are not up for young people to decide? Being honest and frank about that, talking about it, there's nothing bad or wrong about that. It's super transparent, it builds trust, and it's just honest. Young people respond really well to that stuff. I think you all know that. Uh, and so part of what we recommend doing is just being upfront, like, no, that's not a thing that we can uh, do. I really appreciate your input, but it's just not possible. So that firm no versus the people pleasing of like, well, I don't know, I guess I'll check. I get into that people pleasing mode a lot. And so if that is you, if you're a person who's like, I don't want the youth to be upset, um, this is a really tough skill to learn, but a really important one. Uh, the other thing I would say is that we need to define the purpose of what we're doing with folks. So why are they there? Why are they doing whatever it is that they're doing? So that purpose is super clear for folks. Um, and then another one I'd lift up is relationship before the tasks. So the stuff needs to get done, whatever the stuff is, but the care and feed of those relationships matters deeply um, to young people and to us. So that document is there for you to use. Hopefully it is helpful for you as you're engaging your young people as some guidelines to get you thinking about some stuff. And then the other tool that got dropped into the chat for you is a little bit of an assessment tool. It's meant for a variety of different kinds of constituents. So we do some work with birth parents and foster parents or resource parents, as well as with young people. So when we're thinking about our constituent engagement practices, part of what we're trying to figure out is What's the level of participation that folks are at? And is that our desired level? So are we supporting folks in expressing their views and that's all that we're hoping for? Or are we hoping to share power and responsibility in decision-making? So whatever you've decided, executing well on that decision is super important. Um, but you need to decide, where are we at? What kind of resources do we have to support this? And this tool will help you to think about that. Okay, and I think that takes us to questions. So I wanna thank everybody for your attention today, your participation and all the good energy that we've um, generated on the call. I've dropped a couple of links. If there's anything that you were hoping that we would talk about that we haven't yet had a chance to talk about, I'm gonna go ahead and drop my email 
feel free to um, send me a little email. Um, it may take a while. I don't know about you, but my inbox seems to fill at a rate that makes no sense. So it may take a little while. Be patient with me, but I will get back with you eventually. Um, so questions. Thank you, Corey. Corey's also shared his email in the chat. And Chloe's also put in a link to the webinar survey. We'd love to hear your feedback and, and if this webinar met your needs or if you'd like to hear more. I'm not hearing any questions at the moment, but please, um, you know, you're welcome to submit questions at any time. We'll try to connect and make sure we can get you also these resources via email. And I know we're at time, so I'm going to go ahead and close us out and say thank you so much to Eric and Corey and Justice and Aya. We really are grateful for your presentations today. Um, and I know I know that I learned a lot today, so I'm, I'm just so helpful or so thankful. Thanks, thank everybody. you. Thank, thank you so much. Happy Thursday. Have a great.